Why, hello there. Welcome back to the Agassino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agassino Zinger, and this is episode number 402. I'm going to say hopefully it's 402. Hopefully I've got it right. I'm not messing up numbers as I always do, but welcome back to the show. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Great. Amazing. How am I, you know, getting there, hanging on as best as we can in these turbulent times? Aren't I going to be glad or aren't you going to be glad to hear the back of bloody turbulent times or difficult times, unprecedented times, new normal, all these silly crash phrases? I can't wait to see the back of them. But anyway, thanks so much for tuning in to the Excellent Zinger Show on YouTube. If you're listening via YouTube or watching via YouTube, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. And of course, if you're listening via the podcast app, please make sure you leave me a five star review and share the show with all your family and friends. That would be much appreciated. And of course, support via Patreon is always more than welcome. Click the link down below to support the show via Patreon. You get a special bonus show on there, only available for Patreon subscribers only so make sure you click that link down below patreon.com for just agostino that's patreon.com for slash a g o s t i n h o for more details on that one anyway we're back in it we're back in the sector hanging on in doing the best that we can do with the time that we have available and trying to make the best of as i mentioned a sticky situation what have i been up to um not much really in it same old um, we're winding down the lockdown what 2.0 in the uk it's not really felt like much of a lockdown to be honest if i'm completely honest you go outside and you go around the, you know or you don't go outside you check your social media and you see pictures and videos of people uploading in more uh or what do you say um in more affluent areas let's say where people are you know for the most part ignoring the rules doing what they're doing, going outdoors. There's been a weird little kind of workaround, I think, with food trucks. So that's sort of like spurred people to go out. And obviously most places are still able to do takeaway food. So technically, if you can sell takeaway food, you can probably slip in a drink. I don't know, but regardless, it's been a bit weird seeing clips of people out and about drinking on the side of the canal, ordering street food and stuff. It just doesn't make sense. No, that's not me saying, oh, I want everyone to stay indoors and, you know, be like myself you know and just kind of lock yourself away from the world until this thing is over it's just a bit confusing when you get when you hear the message on tv on the news oh we're in a lockdown and then you go outside or you look at your phone or you open the window and you're like i don't think we are mate it doesn't look like that to me so it's been a bit of a weird one it's been a, been a, been a bit of a mind fuck i gotta be completely honest but you know what can you do we're trying the best that we can in this you know odd time i think people have probably exhausted their reserves of giving a shit for the most part it feels like everyone's like you know what whatever happens happens so they'd rather just like live on the edge and sort of like die on the field or die in action i don't know whatever it may be they just would rather live their lives take the risk than have to be sheltered indoors and considering the amount of time we've had under lockdown considering the amount of time most governments have had to kind of assess the information and the reports and the data and the numbers and the cases and the deaths you'd assume there'd be a little bit more how would i say ingenuity about how we would approach things but so far, it's been the same rinse and repeat techniques, isn't it, really? Lockdown, regional lockdown, tier this, close that. Nothing really, um, nothing with any sort of like long, nothing with some sort of end goal, in, with an end goal in mind. It feels like, I've always kind of felt this anyway from the beginning. It always kind of felt to me that most places were just waiting for a vaccine anyway. They didn't really have a plan or like, you know what, we're just going to wait for a vaccine. And we're going to just stem the tide as much as we can before that day happens. Or before it gets worse and you know i guess for the most part it's been proven correct hasn't it like look at what's happened um we've all just been essentially been told to put our lives especially a year for the most part on hold until they figured out a vaccine which from what i've read is unprecedented right they don't usually turn around vaccines or anything to sort of stem um a pandemic such as this in any you know in this short short time so this is really really revolutionary and i'm sure off the back of this many people will win nobel peace prize or nobel prizes i'm pretty sure um for their work in sciences and health and whatever it may be you have or however you classify these things but for us as global citizens of the world as they say it's been a bit shit in it 
um, especially for those who have no support. I think this has been one of my most reflective moments in my life, really, in terms of thinking about whenever I think about how bad I am doing, but whenever I feel bad about my own position, I automatically, it, with, you know, without even thinking, think about somebody else in like a worse situation than myself not even somebody on the streets because that's an easy example right just somebody like 10 percent worse than where i am at five percent let's say even two percent how they must be feeling right now it must be so confusing um especially because there's no answers right there's no answers um there really is no um self-helpy message that someone can give you some sort of like you know um mantra that you can say to yourself to kind of snap yourself out of it because it's just too long i think if this was march april june may july whatever those kind of months fair enough in it but when you're heading into christmas and in the new year it's really hard to tell somebody to like you know have a stiff upper lip right to you know uh pull their shoulders back chin up high it's difficult to do that, especially when you have no prospects. You have no idea what you're going to do in the future. Like, it's all well and good opening up everything next year. But what are people going to do? Like, <laughs> most people, they have, you know, especially if you've got no job, you've got no prospects, you've got no idea where you're going to go. Your housing is all under. Imagine the people that haven't been able to pay rent this whole time. What they've, what have they been doing? They're going to they're gonna amass an, an insane amount of arrears, right? Like, God damn it. That's not even including the people that have businesses. That's one that really gets me when I think, imagine that person that was like, oh, I've got this really successful restaurant and I'm going to open up a little um, hole in the wall, sort of like underground, you know, basement bar downstairs to add on some revenue to my already successful business. Then COVID happens, snap, cut you at the knees. Your restaurant that was booming is now crippled and that bar that you fully kitted out is completely null and void due to the lockdown and stuff. And you and your inability maybe to like adequately um, have it conform to social distancing measures. Absolute madness, man. Absolute madness. And again, these things happen. You know, the government can't be to what to blame for a virus. You know, suddenly sweeping the world and taking us all out. But the response to it has been terrible, man. Terrible worldwide. With the brief, with the small exception, you know, of certain countries who, for some reason. All our governments keep telling us we can't look at certain countries as examples. I don't know why. Whenever something good happens somewhere else, oh no, you can't look at there as an example. You can't look at New Zealand as an example. You can't look at Vietnam as an example. Why can't we look at them as an example? Oh, it's different. It's different. What's different? We're all people, right? We all breathe. We all bleed the same blood. Like, why is it different? Why did they? Why were they able to somehow quell it and handle it a lot better than we were? Like, what are the things that we got wrong and they got right? But again, when you're involved in government, from what I've seen so far, involved in politics, the last thing you can do is admit your rights or your wrong, sorry. You have to obviously take credit for anything that you do that's good because no one's going to pat you in the back of the back and you have to remind your constituents so you can get elected next time around. But you never, under any circumstances in politics, accept your wrongdoings. No way no way wrongdoings what, what wrongdoings they don't exist in your head you don't have any wrongdoings you are a perfect being so that's been a little bit frustrating to see but not surprising you know i think most people who again like myself ignorant well i won't say ignorant what's i was ignorant about it but I, I didn't necessarily pay attention to politics much prior to covid and now that, you know, we've been forced to watch the news on a weekly, sometimes daily, hourly basis, I've become a lot more um, familiar with it. Obviously, read up on a few things, keep my eye open and stuff and just asking some common sense questions. And whenever you come up short, you're like, wow, man, mix. OK, now I get why people are so invested in trying to make whatever little change they can make. Because I was, I was that kind of person I was like, oh, what's the point of getting involved in politics when you can not really affect any sort of change in a mass scale? But I get it. Once you get involved, once you get an interest for it and you see the things that are going wrong and you obviously have a solution that you think might help, you're going to do your level best to try and help because you know how many people is going to help outside of yourself, right? Um, and it can be very intoxicating because there's so many dunces, so many, you know, dumb, numb nuts, yeah, dumb dumbs that are working in government that it's just, you just can't help but feel like I can make a change whether it's minute, whether it's large scale, wherever it may be, I can do something here. I can't be letting these people just get away with this nonsense. And this essentially has been happening for the world to see, you know, especially in the UK, we've just been inundated with, you know, 
idiotic decision after idiotic decision. But hey, I guess you can't be too harsh on these guys because again, they they're just not trained for this. And I think they just um I don't know what they teach them in politics school or whatever they do to get elected, but you'd imagine like conflict resolution, um, speaking clearly, you know, when you're under pressure, um, assertiveness whatever strategic communication whatever there'll be you would think that would be something that would be on the cards and they'd run through these scenarios of like other case studies of things that went wrong in other countries and then kind of run simulations that you know kind of um are sort of akin to what's going on now in the in the, in the modern era you would think so in it like i don't know why i'd think that maybe i watch too many movies but you'd think that'd be what they'd kind of do but they don't it looks like they just i don't know what they learn some policies something along those kind of lines and they just argue with each other in the house of Commons for the most part but apart as a as when it comes to actually impacting our day-to-day -day, or may not impact when it comes to alleviating or making our lives better they have to be really pushed back into a corner really, to make it but hey what can you do apart from complaining about the government what's i've been up to oh i've been i've been finishing off this the Hacienda, How Not to Run a Club by P.O. Hook. Um, I got through, I got through to about halfway through it, I think about halfway, right? Um, but I didn't actually finish the entire book and I'm trying to finish it now, obviously before the end of the year and stuff and a few others. And it's pretty good, man. Pretty interesting. And it's just a, another reminder because obviously my, uh, one of my kind of bucket list kind of long-term goals is to open my own club sometime in the future. And some of the oversights that went along during the epic era of the Hacienda in the, what was that, mid to late 90s, mid, eight, mid 80s to late 90s, it's really incredible to see the amount of mistakes that were made by people. And it's crazy even to imagine that, you know, members of what was it, New Order, right? Yeah, Joy Division and New Order were the co founders of the Hacienda, whilst they were in one, you know, two of the most seminal, you know, bands of all time, especially for UK in the alternative music. And they were also running a nightclub. Like, imagine, how, it, it, that, that's like akin to like Harry Styles and Zayn Malik running Flipping Fold, right, at their peak of their time. <laughs> like, that would be just amazing. Um, at the peak of the time of One Direction, just imagine what that would be. So this, this book is really cool. It kind of runs through loads of their you know the history of running the club from start to finish loads of cool little anecdotes and whatever it may be but just the things that you kind of forget or that you don't really think about when you're because i guess they went into it the same way that i would go into it more so as a fan of dance music as a fan of the culture you know and just thinking hey i can do that thing too but then there are so many things that kind of contribute to the successful running of a club like little things like oh um i think he was talks about here peter when they finally were you know um down to their last penny and they were amassing mounts mountains you know millions of pounds in debt and the club wasn't really making any money they finally decided to hire an actual bar manager right to come in and actually take ownership of the place and actually run it like a business and the first thing that he did when he came in that guy was um he made sure that the bouncers weren't allowed to drink at the door so they weren't allowed to have any alcoholic beverages outside in front. Just tiny things like that. Um, there was a story that supposedly every week they'd repaint the club for some reason. But instead of repainting it using the same materials, they just go and buy new ones every week. They just dump it. So they paint the whole club, dump the new materials, and then rebuy them again the next week at B&Q. And those things, you know, on the, you know, in the immediacy, it doesn't seem like that much money, especially if you're, imagine you're making 100 grand per weekend, whatever it may be. But when you're, it, it adds up over time. Do you know I mean when you're spending a hundred quid, two hundred pound every single week, and it does add up. So those little things were things that kind of impacted the success of the club. And again, you don't think about these things when you're a clubber. You just assume, oh, the lineup is going to sell itself. And another thing they mentioned too that was really interesting was that um, supposedly at their peak, the more successful a night was. I think it's just a good classic promoter's brain. If you're able to get, let's say, Solomon to play at your bar, right? you and you just say hey i'm just gonna play solomon i'm just gonna get solomon to play for the entire weekend let's say friday saturday sunday you would somehow think that because your capacity of your club is 300 people you're gonna get 300 people staying at the bar friday saturday sunday but he said in fact what actually happens is that people that would stay on the friday and saturday are the same people so you don't get any repeat customers so if anything 
um, promoting is a deadly game because you're kind of chasing your tail. You're kind of always having to one up yourself to get fresh people in, which kind of goes to which kind of answers my long held query while the same six or seven people get booked every time for festivals because they can guarantee that they're going to sell a certain amount of tickets each day to new customers, not to the same people. So that's why you get the same sort of names, headlining festivals on the Friday, the Saturday, the Sunday, because they can guarantee, hey, we're going to sell a thousand tickets from that person's name just alone and then the add-ons afterwards. So I thought that was really interesting. So, um, you know, it's just the harsh black and white realities of it. So I recommend you check it out if you're a fan of um, dance music and club culture like myself. The Hacienda, How Not to Run a Club by Peter Hook got it here on screen definitely check it out it's a legendary um an iconic book and definitely essential reading for anyone that's a fan of that era of club culture what else has happened do, 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 do. oh another thing's happened i finally got my moa 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 lola how, how do you pronounce her bloody name how do you pronounce her name i always get it wrong but i finally got the hat i'm gonna make a review soon but um I gotta say man the packaging and stuff wasn't that impressive it just came in a little plastic bag thing with dpd no uh bespoke pla you know she had on her site i think that she had on her socials she had like a little plastic film with a logo all over it. i didn't get that i just got like i just got it stuffed into like a little dpd bag but hey yeah, at least it got here it didn't get bent on the front well there's a bit of a bend here slightly but you know it doesn't look too shabby but quality wise for money i spent not the best but again when I buy stuff like this from smaller designers, I'm not expecting, you know, Hermes level quality of finish. It's more so my, I'm, I'm also lending my support. It's sort of like a, a piece of merch that you're purchasing from, from your favorite artist or band in the hopes that you're going to allow them to continue making the music that you know and love, right? That's kind of the idea because, you know, as a fan of music, hey, he or she's not going to make much on the streaming services. So I'm going to buy merch in order to make sure they can continue doing what they're doing. So I kind of see stuff like this from designers, smaller ones, the same sort of thing, you know, we're sort of buying into these sort of hats and caps so it can allow her to go, you know, designing and doing the stuff she's doing with her main line. I'm pretty sure she's okay, you know, financially and stuff. I'd imagine with the whole Yeezy setup, but still, you know, it's nice to support these small designers when they're coming up. But yeah, it took about two months to come um it's not the best of quality you could probably you know as you can see from the actual clip here i'm holding it up there's no custom tags or anything it's just a standard uh tag whatever she bought that from online and stuff with there obviously custom embroidery but there's nothing else special about it really in terms of it no even there's not even a, a label or a tag in it like a bespoke tag nothing it's just you know the standard thing that you'd get from a you know but again what can you do it is what it is i'll, I'll do a proper review next time but that's another note that I finally got the hat. So it's there. It's there. You know, of course, my head at the moment is a bit humongous with the hair, but soon come, soon come for review. But yeah, anyway, enough about that. Let's get into the show. So many things to talk about, so many things to get through. Don't want to waste any more of your time. So let's dive on deep. Okay. Um, story number one a pretty funny story. Mm, funny. Funny probably isn't the word for this one. Isn't it? I'm not sure if it's funny is the word, but an interesting story nonetheless. So, as I'm sure more of, some of you are aware, there's a viral video going around of this director called Tristan Shapiro, who was essentially, you know, I'm assuming most of you are aware now, isn't it? With the COVID, of course, people can't, you know, um, go and do auditions as per usual. So most of the things I've been hearing from the TV and movie world is that. If you're going to book a job, you have this annoying thing where you have to sometimes quarantine 14 days either side in order to get the job. So if you finally do get a job, you go to the studio, wherever it may be, it's Tyler Perry Studios, wherever it is, and you have to stay on site for 14 days, no matter how long you're filming. Even if you're going to shoot for two or three days, you have to stay there for 14. And then once you're done, you stay, you, you stay another 14 and then you can leave. So, so essentially, regardless of how long you're shooting for, you're, you're having to give a, you're having to give up like a month or two months of your life in order to kind of you know make money um you know do, do the thing that you love whatever it may be so it's a bit it's a bit hard out there people are struggling in all walks of life of course most people like you and i probably want to have sympathy for actors and actresses because you everyone thinks they're fucking multi-millionaires but it's not easy and of course they've got the added pressure now they're having to do auditions via zoom right 
if interviews for jobs weren't bad enough i can just imagine how horrible it must be to how horrible of an experience it must be to do an audition via zoom it must be terrible especially for an industry that wasn't really that receptive to like technology in the first place right the kind of acting entertainment industry look you look at how you know slow they've been to adopting stuff like you know live to streaming you know they make such a big fuss about movies not being available on demand and only be available via cinema the world of movies and tv and all that stuff it moves very very slowly and it's kind of set in its ways so i can imagine a lot of actors actresses young and old are not really used to doing auditions via zoom or doing you know doing auditions remotely at all point blank so to suddenly start doing it now it's a whole different new skill set to learn but of course you know if you want to keep food on the table and you want to make sure you have a roof over your head you have to do what you have to do so it's already a bit of a shitty situation to be in so it's not made it's not made best it's not made better or it's not made like an advantageous situation when the person that you're going to be auditioning for the director is mocking your surroundings that you're living in just before you start your audition because they forgot to unmute their mic how amateurish is this so this is a story from bbc it says director tristram shapiro apologizes to lucas gage after unmuted comments so it says the following uh, director tristan shapiro has apologized after one wittily commenting on an actor's tiny apartment without realizing he could be heard euphoria actor lucas gage was auditioning for a role via zoom early this year when an unmuted shapiro um, began making comments about his home gage um uploaded the video of the encounter to twitter this week shapiro apologized to gage at the time and has now written an open letter for him um to speak about his unsuitable remarks shapiro is a well-known producer and director in hollywood who's worked on the unbreakable kemi schnipp brooklyn 99 and never have i never now oh, uh, let me play let me actually get the clip of the video so you can see what they're talking about this is a clip here lucas gage posts on his instagram page let's play this people live in these tiny apartments like i'm looking at his you know background and he's got oh damn it let's go back let's watch, let's watch that again Bend one second da, 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 da. pop-ups are annoying but let's play that one again there we go let's load up a bit oh this is annoying isn't it it's okay there we go it's back again cool let's play it here as i say <clears throat> These poor people live in these tiny apartments. Like I'm looking at his, you know, background, and he's got his TV and and you know. Yeah, mute it. I know it's a shitty apartment. That's why give me this job so I can get a better one. All right. Um, <laughs> ready? Oh my god, I'm so so sorry. No, it's Lucas. totally. Li listen, I'm living I'm in so a. Sorry. I'm living in a four by four box. It's fine. Just give me the job, and we'll be no, fine. I, I'm more. <laughs> obviously what a piece of shit right like that that needs that there's no even need to say that right but <laughs> i guess the issue is with this is this it, it kind of annoys me to, again i'm not even a bloody actor i'm not even involved in this sort of shit but the annoying thing about this whole thing is that for the most part from what you hear online or what you hear via podcast and stuff with actors you know the acting world is a little bit you know or the entertainment industry already there's so many gatekeepers that exist, right? There's so many hurdles you have to jump over just to get a job, right? It's not really an aspect of you not having the talent or not having a look. For the most part, you know, if you're involved in acting, you are somehow agreeing to this unwritten contract of keeping yourself in a certain shape or having a certain look about you. So you know the things that you need to kind of allow you just to be part of the conversation. So let's put those to one side. Once that's done and you've got the look, you've got the size, you've got the, uh, whatever it may be, the accent, whatever it is, it then requires you to then have to compete with hundreds of thousands of actors and actresses around the world for that one gig. And most of it, most of the actual people that get booked, especially the ones that get the successful, the big jobs are usually um, hired because of their ability to attract people and put people bums in seats. And obviously more importantly, to have eyes in front of laptops and TV screens. That's the main metric are you famous and have you got the ability to pull an audience and if that's the case sometimes that can trump your talent it can trump your appeal it can trump everything on top of it so it's a really 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 um you know 
difficult industry to kind of break through in right so once you've got some kind of lane you've got something about you've got a little bit of hype at this guy through euphoria you're just going to hold on to it for dear life and you hopefully use it to leverage you in other position other roles the issue comes up of it is like off the back of his comments it's i think it'd be fine if you heard this guy saying being behind the scenes oh, i didn't really rate his performance at euphoria he's a bit overrated let's see what you can do i don't know something really scathing about his ability to act right something really critical about his creative experts experts expertise right that'd be perfectly fine but him commenting on his surroundings as if that matters right as if that has any sort of um impact or influence in his ability to act that's the thing that really pisses me off and that's a, that's why i have the assumption that most people even though most people would say oh you know behind closed doors or you know if they said oh what special power would you want to have some people say oh yeah the ability to like see through walls or read people's minds i don't think you'd want to I honestly don't think you'd really want to read people's minds because this is what they actually think when they think that you're not listening this is what they're actually talking about not your skill not your craft not your experience but things that are just ancillary to you things that you just can't even influence things that are not even things that are things that don't have any influence on your ability to do the actual job itself and those are sometimes the things that hold you back so sometimes when you're at work and you think to yourself hey why am i not getting further in my career why am i not connecting with this or that person it's less about the things that you're saying to them and it's more so about the things that they're saying about you behind your back and that's the unfortunate issue especially in entertainment especially in most aspects of work i'd imagine most of the things that impact your ability to succeed are way above or are outside of your remit of actually being able to do the job you know how many times have you been in a place somewhere and the person that gets promoted before you is the one that was able to kind of connect more with the upper management or the person that was a little bit more um sociable and went out more with the colleagues at work or the person that stayed behind the longest but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're doing better work it's just the optics of it right they're being able to stand next to so and so the ability to name drop this person the ability to say you've been there you've been here those are little things that somehow have an influence in an area where they shouldn't really have an influence because at the end of the day this guy can this kid can act who cares if he lives in the cupboard who cares if he lives in the street if he can act his ass off and he's good perfect for the role you hire him right it shouldn't really matter where he's coming from especially in acting right there's so many racks and riches stories of people you know who were dirt poor and you know were given the chance and suddenly they become the biggest things to slice bread and that's the issue i have with it and again even worse so because this lucas sorry this um tristram shapiro guy this director isn't even that big of a deal this isn't flipping you know this isn't martin scorsese right this is just some middle of the road guy that works on tv but has influence has connections is well known so imagine if you do that into that imagine if that goes left and you start saying some you know rude things to this guy he can essentially blacklist you from the entire industry or snap of a finger say you're difficult to work with say you don't take direction well all this sort of stuff bad mouth you and you'd have imagine this is years before you'd have no recourse because you have no evidence so that's the issue that at, at hand here she's so kind of middle of the road people gatekeepers who are essentially stunting young actress or young creatives career in an industry that kind of is resistant to change right it's so 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 bad he wrote a statement apologizing about the issue here let's say what he actually had to say so he says here um by tristan shapiro he wrote an uh, open letter to deadline to to kind of clear his name up he says the following you probably don't know who i am but you're likely familiar with my story an actor lucas gage posted a clip on social media taken from a zoom casting call and i'd been part of back in august during it an unmuted director makes reference to tiny apartments of these po these poor people referring to actors the quick-witted gage responded that he knows his apartment shitty da -da -da. since gage posted a clip he has had millions of views and he has received what is it what is he's up on letter is that his upper letter okay since he puts his he's received a million of views since case person of view so he had a million of views and he has received support from all corners of the world and from many of his fans initially the director was not initially identified although there was some speculation about who it was despite what is probably wise advice to say the least possible and let this pass on i decided to come forward take responsibility to make the apology mr gage deserves and offer some background for my unacceptable insensitive remarks i am tristan shapiro a 20-year veteran of television and director in half in the uk and half in the second half here in the u.s first and foremost 
foremost her feminist engagement my sincere and unrivaled unvarnished apology for my offensive words my unprofessional behavior during the audition and for not giving him the focus the attention he deserves my job is to evaluate performance and against the part um, that i'm trying to cast lucas is a better this Zoom audition call took place in August. After four months of lockdown, a number of my co-workers were also in the auditions, which happened over several days. It was an emotional to see what actors working so hard to win the few parts available, and we were deeply moved by the passion of these young actors under their extraordinary circumstances. I was, oh, look at this guy. The cleanup is immense. I was using the word poor in the sense of deserving sympathy as opposed to the economic judgment. My words were being spoken from a genuine place of appreciation for the actors or having to endure stuck in the confined spaces finding within themselves to give a role winning performance under these conditions as i say on the video i'm mortified about what happened while i can't put the proverbial toothpaste back in a tube i am more looking forward from this incident more i move forward from this incident a more empathetic man a more focused director and i promised an even better partner to actors from the audition process to the final cut but that's not again that's all well and good but the issue here at hand is that if you're a director and you have clout or you have some sort of name behind you you can probably get away with this more so than the actor can they're more disposable right if he freaked out if he acted out said some unbeknown you know said some rude crude stuff over the zoom call he would be completely excommunicated from the industry people be branded difficult brand is difficult to work with and just be you know um disregarded or dumped to the side so that's the issue here at hand the fact that you know you can kind of maneuver and do exactly as you please as a director but as the actual talent in front of the camera quote unquote is super difficult so again um big dickhead energy in that regard um be careful <laughs> during your interviews on zoom or your auditions make sure your your camera or your microphone is muted when you're in an uncompromised position and just know that behind closed doors the people that are meant to be helping you the most the people that are meant to be in your corner are probably not helping you out so you probably owe yourself the best to probably put your best foot forward and just keep your eye on the prize don't think anyone's going to come in and help you because as proven here by this director nobody nobody absolutely cares they're all in it for themselves and if anything they have pity on you which is the worst thing ever in my opinion anyway moving on here what else do we have oh, of course we have an update here in the uk regarding covid19 um we've now what we're going to come out of lockdown next week so from wednesday the 2nd of december we're going to finally come out of lockdown 2.0 like i mentioned previously it's not really been a lockdown to be fair it's been a bit of a lockdown light but still we're going to have the ability to maneuver around the city uh, where i am in london or around the uk a lot easier than we were previously and for me the most important thing is that we're going to have the gyms are going to be reopening i think from what boris johnson said earlier there's not going to be a situation under any lockdown where gyms are going to be closed. They're going to be obviously, you know, maybe um, they're going to half the capacity, but they're not going to be under a situation where we're going to have to go without. And that's a real, real blessing in this regard. So news here says COVID-19 PM sets out tougher post-lockdown tiers for the England. It says here, in gyms and non-essential shops in all parts of England will be allowed to reopen when lockdown ends next month, the Prime Minister has announced. Boris Johnson told the Commons, that the three tiered regional measures will return from december the second but he added that each tier will be toughened spectators will be um, able to return to the sporting events which is absolutely insane and weddings and collective worships will resume now i don't have a problem with spectators going back to sport i think you know the whole what we've been told so far with covid is that it doesn't spread as easy um, in open air environments hence why people don't tend to wear their face mask when they're outdoors having a drink whatever it may be so that's fine but of course we get told it, sp it spreads via aerosol spits whatever that and shouting and singing so that's going to be hard that's going to be hard or odd to see how they're going to kind of quell that and also there's a part of me that's thinking if you can open stadiums up right in a limited capacity then why can't you open up clubs in limited capacity because bars and clubs are open i mean well bars and pubs are open sorry of course most of them are saying that you have to have a substantial meal in order to have a drink indoors but you're still spending a lot of time indoors you're still drinking you're still speaking in close quarters especially without a face mask when you're having a meal having a drink so it doesn't necessarily make any sense why clubs are still closed right in their capacity at the moment now of course i'm not saying they should be open how they were prior but there should be a possibility there should be some sort of scenario where you can open a club to 
50, 30, 25% of the capacity just to allow them to have some ability to make some money, to generate something, especially during the times when, or especially in the UK, when the government is kind of, you know, reluctant to support the nighttime industry in any sort of meaningful way. That would be a best sort of like middle ground to make. Again, what do I know? It continues here. Regions will not find out which tier they will be in until Thursday, so that's coming up soon. The allocation of the tiers will be dependent on a number of factors, including each tier's case numbers, the reproduction rate or the R number, and the current and projected pressure on the NHS locally. Tier allocations will be reviewed every 14 days, and the regional approach will last until March. So, you know, we're going to have a long, long, long new year ahead of us, which kind of makes me think why... It kind of annoys me as well because we've got this conversation happening and at the moment where there's supposed to be going to be a little bit of a Christmas pause to allow people to go and celebrate Christmas, you know, for four days, I think four or five days, however much it is. And part of me thinks, hey, I understand, I get it. For some people, spending time away from family during Christmas is just unforgivable. They just cannot do it for their mental health, for their family, for just, you know, whatever it may be. They need to just see people and not be alone. But the fact that we've been under lockdown, the fact that we've been under restricted movement for the best part of a year, is there something to be said for just scrapping it and just forgetting about Christmas this year and just allowing us to basically sacrifice our Christmas in order to have a better new year? Would you be able to, wouldn't you be up for that? I know I would, personally speaking. Again, maybe I'm the worst person to ask because I've never really given a shit about Christmas, but I would rather, I would much rather sacrifice my Christmas so I could have a better new year, personally then have this law of like weird five day you know little bubble that you can go out and celebrate and doesn't really make any sense in my opinion but again it continues the pm who is self-isolating after meeting an mp who later tested positive for covid19 told ministers via video link he expected more regions will fall at the least temporarily into the higher levels than before he said he was very sorry for the handship that has um such restrictions would um cause business owners speaking later down the street mr johnson said that things will look and feel very different after easter with a vaccine and mass testing hopefully so let's see some of these actual um blocks that he put out here that's sort of infographic sort of detailing whatever is going to happen going forward so tier one medium alert this is the lowest tier that you could be in in a region in the uk will allow you to meet friends and family a maximum of six people indoors or outdoors you've got ability to meet in pubs and restaurants venues must be able to serve service able service only so most of the bars and clubs that were sort of like getting around the idea of not being open by offering table service will be super happy but the only issue is that you know in the uk it's cold as f during the winter times as most of you are aware so i'm not too sure how these guys are going to survive um in these conditions doing table service outdoors you know it's going to be a bit difficult but hey let's see how they do it um they must stop taking orders from 10 p.m and must are closed by 11 and go retail be open as normal work and businesses everyone can work from home should do but of course if you can in office you can do that too personal care like bars salons and in the hairdressers will be open accommodation open gyms open education early year setting schools and college and universities open child care and otherwise supervised overnight stay permitted weddings and funerals 15 people entertainment places of worship exercise so nice this is probably the best thing right and then i just got here large events sport and live performances and business limited to 50 percent. so this is the interesting part so we're going to get probably more details later on so i'd assume by next week there'll be a whole slew of announcements from places that are able to do it so if you're in tier one you can have live events up to 50% of your capacity or 4,000 people outdoors, whichever is lower and 50% capacity indoors. So that's a really big um, sort of eye opening. No, that's a really big um, relief, I guess, for a lot of places that need it going forward. And of course, traveling, walk or cycle if possible, plan ahead and avoid busy times and routes on public transport. So that's one. But then I guess most places will be in tier two or three, I'm assuming so tier two is high alert which says meeting and family and friends no mixing of household and doors bars and pubs will be open though but they must close on oh sorry bars and pubs must close on tier two okay cool hospitality venues can only serve alcohol with substantial meals okay so this is the one that people are really annoyed by then tier two because bars and pubs can only be open if you're selling meals if not then you have to close 
retail open as usual personal care gyms and again like i said previously the only thing that i'm really bothered about is the gyms and they're gonna it looks like regardless of what alert you're in this is like tier three very high alert the gyms will be open for group activities and class uh group activities and classes should not take place okay but open anyway in general so under no circumstances under any tiers will gyms close which is flipping awesome so let's get back to tier two life performances says here tier two the same and then tier three life performances let's see what it says there events should not take place driving events permitted so i guess for most places the death nail will definitely be a tier three that would definitely be the one that no one actually wants to be in i think tier two tier two is probably most places but tier one's an optimistic place if you're definitely in the low number so let's see what happens going forward again i'd much rather sacrifice my christmas for a happier new year um especially with the vaccine on the way you know there is some light in the tunnel but i understand people's need to see family and friends during christmas you know it's been a hard year if there's some welcome relief some respite it's what's been going on you know by having the ability to meet people for dinner exchange some gifts during christmas i get it but personally for me i'd much rather something else but hey what can you do what can you do moving on moving on deep we got this funny video from where's this from this is from kent bbc video from the bbc it says covid19 it doesn't feel like a lockdown which i've mentioned before and it it doesn't really feel like it you know everyone's just doing what they want to do and the bbc did a little reportage um focusing in a place in kent called swell and tanif in the southeast are among some of the worst in england the rates uh, bbc's dan johnson has been trying to find out if people are sticking to the rules in canterbury where case numbers are still rising and bucking a national trend in england where case numbers are dropping so let's quickly play this you wouldn't even know it's lockdown doesn't really feel anything like a lockdown. The roads and everything like that still seem as busy as it would normally. I don't think people are abiding by the rules at all. If you've spent mm -hmm. the last three weeks stuck in, sat on the sofa, you may not realise how much of life is actually going on in a place like Canterbury. But it's very different this time. Different rules, more reasons people can be out. And therefore, some are asking, lockdown? What lockdown? Because people decide that rules are for other people, you're going to end up in a situation where We've come out and everyone goes, we want to get back together. But it's like, but the way that you've collectively behaved is going to stop us doing that. I just... And that's essentially the issue. But I think the precedent was set with Dominic Cummings, isn't it? When I think that's what set the tempo, when that sort of set the vibe of how people were basically responding to lockdown. And since then, no one's really given a shit. It sort of felt like, which kind of shows you that, you know, what is it? The Jocko Wernick book, isn't it? Um, or the what's the other book? Leaders, great le leaders eat last. That whole idea, right? That there is a trickle down effect. When others see, when uh, when the people below, quote unquote, see the people above, kind of skirting the rules and doing what they want, they're obviously going to follow suit too. They're going to be like, hey, it's not one rule for you, one rule for me. Fuck this, I'm going to enjoy my life as well. And that kind of trickles down. And now, of course, you know, sprinkling some COVID deniers, COVID idiots. It's just a whole shit sandwich of issues going on at the moment. So, again, I'm not surprised, really. Really not surprised. I just think if the masks and the distancing and the hand sanitizing works, what's the need for the lockdown? And it just doesn't make sense. They change the rules all the time. And the general public, we just think they don't know what they're doing. So why should we comply? They seem clueless preach you're not worried about the risks of the virus i think my mental health is far more sensitive yes no i think you've got to go out you know if it's just a couple of people going for a walk it's not the end of the world personally yeah that's what i think and it's unfair that in schools you're allowed to gather yeah in schools you're allowed 30 people or more but you're not allowed to sit six people in a park i think a lot of people are exactly. just now out and about because they just don't know when it's going to end. So I think a lot of people kind of taking their own initiative and just, you know, I've been outside going for walks, nothing wrong with that. What are you doing out today then? I'm just going to the shop to get some carrots. <laughs> Essential carrots. <laughs> Essential carrots. 
Uh, there's an awful lot of people who've just had enough and then they don't care anymore. You do see that sort of in a lot of the gatherings and it's evidenced in a lot more of the fines that have been happening to the students around here. Guys, can we ask you a question for the news? Can we get your opinion for the news, madam? Give us a quick word for the news, mate. Guys, can we get... Oh, he shook his head before I could even say anything. Are you playing by the rules? I am playing by the rules. I've got my face mask and everything. What have we got there? Pancakes? Pancakes, chocolate chip bars. Essential buying, then. Essential buying. He's still... And th th that goes to show my issue of this all, all in the end. I guess it's looking, as more time is passing, it's looking more and more like most places, most governments across the world were just waiting for a vaccine, really. They had no idea how to deal with this. And th that's the really concerning part. We've had so many other pandemics in the past that we can sort of learn from the lessons, the good, the bad, but no one's really applied them. No one's really, you know, people in government aren't really students of history for some reason again i don't know why don't ask me that's some occupation but you just assume if you were involving yourself in politics that it'd be some sort of vocation for you right it'd be like actual calling you want to go out of your way to know everything you can about world history so that it could inform your decisions you know that you make on a smaller local sometimes national white nationwide level it, it'd certainly make you a better politician i'd imagine being more worldly but no one's really heeding lessons from the past. No one's taking learnings from the places that have done stuff well, right? That's that's a kind of sacrilege. You can never mention another country and sort of like relate it back to where you live. You're not allowed to do that. And we're just all kind of just sat around twiddling our thumbs, waiting for a vaccine to to kind of um, emerge from the um, from nowhere. And luckily, you know, the great scientists out there have been working extremely hard, virologists, wherever they are. And, you know, we have a few things in the in the pipeline, a few things that are coming up. So that is definitely something to hold on for as hope. But it's disappointing to see the people that we elected, you know, in these high offices to help us out have sort of failed, routine, have failed in a big, big way. And it will, it's interesting to see what happens on the other side of this, what the reckoning is going to be like, because there's definitely going to be a lot of people going to be held accountable for the years and years of trouble and grief they've kind of caused people across the country, across the world, with how they've dealt with COVID. But hey, let's see, let's see, let's see. What else we have here moving forward? Let's crack on. Oh, we have an update from Mr. Octavian. He is fighting his case um, loudly. It seems like, which I guess, again, you know, I'm not for cancelling in general. I think, you know, people should basically be um, innocent until proven guilty. But unfortunately, in the society we live in at the moment, that's just not um, that's just not the reality of where we're living right now. Right. Unfortunately, there are some things that occur on social media that you can unfortunately be completely canceled for and your career can be completely erased at the flick of a switch. And I had long held beliefs before COVID that, you know, for the most part, there seemed to be a little bit of a different rule for people in hip hop, black people specifically and others when it came to being canceled, I wasn't really sure what that was about. I couldn't really put my finger on it. Maybe it was guilt for holding back, you know, black music in the UK. UK for a long time has been struggling right there was only it felt like five or so record contracts available every other year for people now it seems like it's flourishing more than it's ever done in the past and maybe you know weirdly enough society societal societally we've just kind of felt like hey let's give these guys a break they've been suffering for a long period of time and let's you know just turn a blind eye to some of their kind of indis indiscretions but unfortunately for Octavian, he's probably picked the worst time to get cancelled because we're all at home. I've mentioned in a previous occasion on the podcast that this is probably the worst time to get involved in some sort of public scandal because everyone's bored, everyone's got time, everyone's on their phones. So they're going to be a lot more, they're going to be way more invested in your situation than they probably might have been in the past when they had other things going on. And I think Octavian's definitely suffered from it, even though what he's been accused of is really heinous right he's been alleged by his um, ex-partner that he abused her physically and mentally um for a prolonged period of time and she uploaded you know some really grueling harrowing accounts of what happened from her obviously point of view some clips some pictures of some of the abuses she suffered allegedly from his hands and often you know for again from a 
from my standpoint or from the standpoint you know from not being involved and not knowing these people from adam and eve it doesn't look good it does not look good for octavian whatsoever it looks really really bad when somebody that you allegedly were in a you know committed relationship with is now coming out with you know heaps and heaps of 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 evidence that you've been abusing them physically and mentally for a prolonged period of time so much so that they're willing to put their name to a police report right because that's what really separates i think sometimes the ch not say the chances but the people that are act out to like quickly make a quick buck from somebody get a bit of clout for the most part whenever you went out from the things that i've studied or i've seen or observed in society especially in pop culture especially with celebrities or especially with people that are trying to make a name for themselves like i think she is she's kind of an artist in her own right trying to do something you know you don't really want this sort of stuff hanging over your head for a prolonged period of time especially if you want to progress your career in some way shape or form but when you go to the lengths that she has to file a report to put this all out in the public tag him she even said in one of the statements that she purposely wanted Need to put this information out there during the run-up to his album that was meant to come out to damage his album sales and to alert his fans to who he actually is in her point of view it definitely makes you think hmm this might be legit but again who knows it could be all fabricated um octavian is out here defending himself in any way shape or form that he can and although i don't think he's going to win this battle it's interesting to watch from the outside in and see exactly how he's if he's able to rect to rescue to save his career in any way meaningful way going forward but let's play a clip here of here what octavian has to say regarding the issue and how he intends to fight it the truth every day not showing you that all the evidence i have is killing me i can't sleep at night it's killing me this is i'm sorry but the do rag the earring the little you know the little knee movements oh man it's a it's a real epic fall from grace i have to say especially from a, as being a fan myself of him and kind of following his, his career quite closely from the what's that first video when he's in a car you know what I mean? Like, I, f I followed his career for a bit, you know, and it's, the drop-off has been really, really, um, the drop-off has been really harsh, isn't it, in terms of his quality of music. Not him as a person, because, you know, I, I try not to follow the artists I know and love on social media, because I don't want to see too much. But in terms of just pure artistry, I don't know why. Maybe it's, you know, indulging himself too much in the nightlife, wherever it may be, but he's definitely um, declined in terms of his ability to make songs, you know, and put together great melodies, um, interesting projects, videos, whatever it may be. It's definitely suffered over the time. It's the biggest defamation of character in history. <laughs> Everyone's thinking that what she put up is proof. It's not the video. Defamation of character in history. Like, does he. I, I don't know. Videos are edited, they are put together very, very carefully to make me look a certain way. But however, it's not the way it went down. Okay, L let's take his side on things there. Let's say, let's imagine that he's saying the truth and, you know, and the videos were put together in a way to purposely make him look a certain way. Cool. But what can he show as evidence to counteract what she put out there? Legitimately, let's, let's say you're his friend. And you want to help him out what can he do what can he actually say that will make you think that he didn't do the things that this girl is alleging or saying that he did she's not even alleging she's saying he did these things she's uploading the pictures and the images and the videos as proof hey this is what happened during that time that i told you when he did x y and z how can you counteract that what can you legitimately say or show you can add more context to the issue cool you had an argument and then what you decided to punch her in the face still doesn't help you okay you can have more context in the issue she hit you first cool and you decided to beat her into the corner of her bed still doesn't help you right you're in an abusive relationship okay cool so then you decided to what kick her in the street like no scenario no amount of evidence in my opinion context will help his case none maybe for, again because i think this similar to the brian callen situation maybe there is an aspect you know when you're somebody of notoriety and you're an artist and you finally made your way you got your contract it's you know it's a long grind regardless if you're you know even if you're a flipping um industry plan it's not easy to get people to give a shit about your music right try to try uploading a track on soundcloud with no following and see what happens right it's quite it's quite demoralizing so to finally get a position 
to get finally put yourself in position, right? I understand the need to defend that with all your might, right? Because he's drowning right now. No label, no representation, videos of the YouTube, directors are denouncing him, blah, blah, friends that always, you know, ex friends are putting out statements, blah, blah, blah. His whole world is coming crashing down. So I understand the need to kind of scramble and save whatever you can of your career. But long term, you know, what is this really going to change? Even if he comes out and proves that they were in some sort of toxic relationship that, you know, resulted in both parties doing and saying things that they probably shouldn't have done in a loving relationship, really, until we take it a bit too far. Unfortunately, when you're the dude and the girl uploads images of herself bruised and battered with text screenshots of you coming across like a real cunt, right? There's not really much you can do to counteract it. Not much you can do. We've been together for three years. She put three years into one slide and said that this is how I was the whole time. But there was witnesses there, there were people there, and I can't wait to show you all the evidence that I'm not who she says I am. Okay, next one. I'm messaging my family um, that that's not fair and calling them monsters and disgusting for being my family. Please stop cussing my mum who died. Like, you lot don't understand what abuse can do to someone like it, it didn't go well for everyone do you know what i'm saying and um i encourage everyone just to look back at the videos that she posted and again i encourage everyone to really read between the lines of what she's saying because she could have think but then um, that's the issue that he has at this moment it's not our responsibility to go out and try and clear his name he has to clear his own name we don't owe him anything unfortunately as a view in public or as even fans you don't owe him the right to go out there and re-examine the evidence he needs to prove about any sort of doubt that he didn't do the things that he's been alleged of doing and again who knows maybe he has more evidence about it but unfortunately in the court of public opinion you've been you know the case is case is shut and closed really really in terms of what actually happened there's not much else you can add to this situation i don't feel think, think again and think what actual evidence is there that i've been abusive for what she says is three years that she's in Dubai for her safety. I was the one who sent her to Dubai. When I went to Ibiza and I posted pictures in Ibiza, she was in Dubai and I sent her there with her best friend. It, it's all a lie. Oh, I don't know, man. I don't know. I guess pray for both for the minute in this respect. Hopefully they work it out and, and you know it, they come to some sort of amicable, amicable solution. It probably won't come out of a solution because you know there's too much money involved in it. But hey. Let's see what happens going forward. So hopefully they sort it out. Next on the list here, what else do we have? We want to speak about. Oh yeah, let's speak about Dutch in it. My man Dutch Valley. I just want to say my man. I don't know the guy. You know, I'm definitely not going to claim him now. But Dutch has been involved in a whole heap of madness over the last couple of days, and it. <laughs> It all started off pretty innocently enough for him, isn't it? It started off pretty innocently. You know, somebody... Innocently is not really the right way to say this is the start. But regardless, somebody hacked into Dutch Valley's phone, right? Because he has some bullshit house password. So that's his first mistake. But of course, you know, the person who's to blame is the hacker, right? Hey, so, you know, probably lay off hacking people's phones, if you don't mind. His phone gets hacked dms and you know whatever else get leaked to the public and for the most part it's all quite innocent right there's a few thirsty texts between him and some um young girls in the industry all lucy of age there's a few of him trying to chase drake around on the uh, on the on the dms but for the most part it's fairly pg nothing too embarrassing a bit cringe inducing you know again i i, I long maintain no man should see another man's dms right it should always be things that are sort of like godly tight godly yeah godly cl godly got closely guarded secrets you shouldn't ever be showing your dms to some people or kind of show hey give me tips or whatever maybe you're giving them access they should always there should be things that go to your grave because seeing another man how they get down the dms is always really cringy and always kind of makes you just go on a recoil and just kind of vomit in your own mouth and this is exactly what happened to dutch Valley. so he got caught out um with a hack the DMs got leaked and for the most part, like I said, all really innocuous, right? So there's a little roundup of some of the <laughs> DMs of him talking to various females on the old DM. They got one of this lady called Tiz Tizandos. Tizandos. 
at some at this point in life i'm somewhere in jesus christ but nowhere i do know where but if you would like me to link you you can tell me from now so first obviously mistake there and talking to a girl that sounds like that is just you know an absolute mad situation he does it anyway you know they have a little bit of a flirty conversation it's all going pretty well it's all a bit horrendous you know you can quite clearly see that he doesn't necessarily have um the game that you would assume somebody like a dutch valley to have again not for me to say but for just to read from what i'm seeing online it doesn't look as if like he knows how to speak to women in a very eloquent manner and then the other bit that's quite <laughs> embarrassing was obviously him chasing drake around in the dms i'm never gonna play that because it makes me cringe too much and then it took a really dark turn a really really dark turn where the dutch valley has been accused of being a nonce and uh, Peter, which you know, knowing what you know now regarding the stuff that's being, you know, um, thrown around out there now in society, those aren't the bestest of terms that you want to be attributed to. You don't want people going out there in the streets calling you a pedo or a nonce. It's not something that you can claim with your chest. Let's say that. So, the first sort of like indication of this was from this clip here. So, big up to T Talk. Or oh, you heard it here first, right? Ink, and they uploaded this image, and this is a screenshot of Dutch Valley talking to allegedly some girl that was fourteen years old. Again, we don't have any proof of if this person actually exists. If they are fourteen, what we do have is just the DMs that are obviously circulating and now on the social media sites. And for some reason, I don't know whether or not this got sort of like forgotten about at the time, or people just sort of like remembered it later on. But they were part of the initial leak at the first point. So this is the first sort of images of the dms between um allegedly between dutch and this 14 year old girl so you know you got the standard things i think she's talking about herself i was just tanning it was hotter day today though so i'll go in today he says i'm coming which of course is odd considering that later on he then describes this 14 year old girl as a family friend so to speak to someone that you would uh, you know initially regarded your niece in this way is odd regardless and the fact that they're 14 makes it utterly bizarre so you know not looking good so far we're only two bubbles in right <laughs> or three bubbles in um they continue doing a bit of harmless flirting wait should i come question mark she says i don't mind up to you he obviously doesn't say nothing there another video gets uploaded he says what's that i can't see it's a meme of me going to my room to take a nap he laughs she double taps the laugh emoji which is always a bit of a which is always a bit of a madness in it usually that double tap on the heart emoji on your messages is definitely an indication of something might be up so again not looking good for dutch it continues here on a second dm um he says that what did he say to her that ain't your toes though you're so annoying she says back to him send it to me so he wants pictures of her toes and i guess this is where he allegedly messes up right or where people are saying that this is kind of evidence of a nonce she uploads a picture of ruby rose and little tj from back in the day right i'm assuming when they were dating still that allegedly says shrug face emoji he says what are you trying to tell me question mark question mark my babes don't worry we're gonna make the same pick soon xx yeah, 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 yeah. which is to say it's questionable to say the least it's already weird right because the girl's allegedly 14 so you're already skating on the thinnest of ice you're not even skating in ice you're drenched in fucking ice cold water right you're struggling you're gasping for air you're trying to look for somewhere to grab onto to save yourself but there's no way to be saved every time you try and grab onto a ledge someone stamps on your fingers right you are drowning absolutely drowning to somebody that's a family friend that is a madness like beyond the madness to say the least right especially for somebody in position now my theory in this is most most likely this is just evidence of somebody that's got new wealth and just like from all the dms that have been leaked this guy's just raging horny it seems like in the dms on a 24 7 basis which again you can't blame the guy right newly minted young dude tall young handsome whatever it may be that girl's kind of um ascribed to dutchavelli and now you know he's getting thrown more pussy than he could probably know what to do with 
and he's sort of like you know trying to keep up with everything i guess juggling it and in the midst of juggling it he decides to go and holler at our 14 year old family friend that's where it gets tricky because if this was just some random thirsty messages from random people of age you know Dachavelli's horny in the DMs, but this is a family friend and she's 14. Yikes. It continues here. He put smiley emoji. She double smiles back again. Again, no one's being an adult in this conversation or saying anything different. It continues here. We've got video record or audio clip recordings from Instagram. Already for kids. I think I can sense it. <laughs> After today, I need to sit and think about what I'm doing in my life. You need to think about what you're doing talking to a 14 year old brother but jesus christ man and you know it goes on and on and on more continuing there um more messages more messages more messages and like you know there's no point in me showing all this stuff but the general gist of it is that it's being alleged now that he's a nonce right it's being alleged that he's a pedo and you know there's uh, some other damaging information too that's come out regarding steph london and her complice um complicity in the situation right if she was an accomplice if she's complicit in it whatever it may be this i won't read too much into it to be fair like you know that is his big sister she's gonna you know as bad as it is she's gonna do whatever she can to protect him and sort of like you know make sure she can defend him in any way shape or form i'm sure if he caught a body she'd probably say he didn't do it right that's what it is and your siblings you're never gonna throw him under the bus regardless of how he his alleged crimes are but it's not looking good for the guy it really isn't looking good and allegedly the person that's related to the girl is now on this clip here kind of you know airing her out basically by saying the following Steph, listen, you know what this is about, innit? Like, your brother's grooming a 14-year-old girl, child. And you get the gist in it, essentially, right? So, is he guilty, yes or no? Who knows? Honestly, don't know. Like, number one, we don't know the person. Are, are they... Is this person actually 14? No, they actually are. We do know. Dutch really confirmed, didn't he, in his later post. So we do know the person's 14. I don't know, man. Can you... It's not good, right? That's for sure. It's not good for him. Um, whether or not he can be cancelled for this, I'm not too sure. That's the thing I'm not really sure about. Because what are they going to say? What, that he was being a little bit too flirty? with a member of his family allegedly that was underage on the dms did anything actually happen in real life no the grooming side of it of course is really concerning right that's how um that's something that's obviously been in the current conversation for a while especially when you look at the issues that happened with chris D'Elia and the previous allegations due to the comedy scene in la so there is that aspect about it but it's difficult to see what could actually happen as in terms of consequences for this sort of actions when it comes to dutch Will your record label drop him for getting slang in the DMs of a 40 year old that he knows? I'm not too sure. Um, will that affect his ability to go perform live shows places? Especially because think about it logically, right? This is the thing that really is concerning about this whole thing, especially with COVID. Everywhere has not had the ability, most places, venues have not had the ability to make any sort of income. They've all been closed. No support for the most part from the government or you know minimal support when they do reopen with vaccines in place are they going to be are, will there be venues where that will be willing and open to hosting a gig from Dachavelli in order to obviously allow them to make some money put some bums in seats sell some drinks at the bar probably will his fans hardcore fans that love him and ride for die for him still go and support him most probably and will he be able to just kind of ignore this and move on? Most likely. That's the issue. I don't necessarily see a... Unless he was doing what that kid did. That guy did in Mitchum, was it in South? Where he legitimately tried to abduct a, uh, you know, a young girl in, in broad daylight. I don't see a scenario where he can completely get destroyed. Like, I don't see it, personally. It's really concerning. Again, it's really bad, but it just i don't see it I'm the, with what's going on now and how the industry is and you know peace and people are quiet and not really saying too much about the situation and sort of keeping mum about it of course because these associations and you know you know what he means to the industry at large i just don't see them cancelling him for, for that i just don't unless there's more information to come out 
that's the only way I see it happening in my opinion but again let me know your thoughts down below in the comments let me know what you think about it I'd love to hear your thoughts anyway that's your Zing Show episode number 402 thanks so much for tuning in as per usual it's been a pleasure to have your company if you're tuning in via YouTube make sure you smash that like button hit subscribe and leave me a comment down below and if you're watching or listening via the podcast app, make sure you leave me a five star review and share the show with your friends until then take care be safe peace